Well, good morning, folks. Happy Friday. Welcome to this next installment of the California Policy Forum series. This is an ongoing partnership co-presented by Philanthropy California, the California Association of Nonprofits, and the League of California Community Foundations. I'm Laura Seaman, CEO of the League of California Community Foundations, and we're a statewide coalition of 30 community foundations across California. We're very grateful for the partnership of Philanthropy California and Cal Nonprofits on this series and on this webinar, where we'll dive into the California state budget and explore proposals, processes, and opportunities for advocacy by civil society leaders like yourselves. Great, thank you, Laura. Yes, hi, I'm Lucy Salcido Carter uh, with Cal Nonprofits. And for those of you who don't know, Cal Nonprofits is a policy alliance of more than 10,000 nonprofit organizations. We support policies that protect and promote the nonprofit sector in California. So as Laura mentioned, this webinar is about the California state budget. We will cover the governor's January budget proposal, the budget process generally, and ways that nonprofits and philanthropy can get involved in budget advocacy. So, why the state budget? Well, the state budget is important to us as nonprofits and foundations because of the numbers in it, of course. They dictate which departments and programs get what amount of funding and affect our government contracts and grants and the government services that people in our communities are able to access. For philanthropy, they can affect strategies for where to put foundation resources, either to leverage dollars in the budget or also to address gaps in the budget. But the words in the budget are important to us too. And I think that's an easy part to miss. They put parameters around programs and they define requirements. They can affect our eligibility for funding or how we have to run contracted programs. The words in the budget bills when signed, they are law, just like any other language in a bill that is signed into law. And the budget process can be mysterious and feel inaccessible. Even if we've been involved in state legislative efforts, we may not know how to translate that information and those experiences into how to influence the state budget. And it is true that a lot of budget discussions happen behind closed doors, but there are also opportunities for nonprofits to engage in the public process around the budget, but also to influence what gets said behind those closed doors. And we'll talk more later about how nonprofits can do that. So to kick us off today, I wanted to just give you all a quick news flash about a budget success that Cal Nonprofits has been involved in and that affects nonprofits in California. On Tuesday, Governor Newsom signed Senate Bill 87 into law through a rushed budget process. So it's not part of the regular process. It was a rushed process. And it allocates $2.075 billion in COVID-19 relief funding to nonprofits and small businesses. The governor's proposed budget, which you'll hear more about soon, had allocated $575 million. So a significant increase in, in this, um, this bill that was just passed into law. The new law also has a set aside of $50 million just for nonprofit cultural institutions, which is an increase really doubles what was in the uh, governor's proposed budget. Um, he, had in, he had 25 million in his. So through our advocacy early on in this year's budget process, we've also been able to get into the words of the bill, requirements that the grant program include outreach to nonprofits, more nonprofit expertise, more consideration of impacted industries that include nonprofits and data collection on the number of nonprofits getting grant awards. So I just wanted to hold that up as an example. We didn't get everything we wanted, but we did get some important additions to the bill, both in the numbers and in the words. Uh, so with that example of successful advocacy by nonprofits, I wanna introduce our key speakers for today's webinar. We have Chris Haney, who is the Executive Director of the California Budget and Policy Center. And if you haven't looked at their website, please do. They publish great reports on a broad range of budget and policy issues. We also have Luann Wynn, who is the Personal Budget Consultant for Senate District 30 and was the budget consultant for Senator Holly Mitchell when she was the chair of the Senate Budget Committee. And we also have Amber Rose Howard, who is the executive director of 
Californians United for a Responsible Budget, also known as CURB, a statewide coalition working to shift government spending from policing and corrections to human services and to supporting racial, economic, and environmental justice. And we also have Brian Kaneda, who is the LA coordinator for CURB. So with that, um, I just want to remind people, please do put your questions in the Q&A box. We are going to take some time throughout the webinar and also at the end to address as many questions as we can. We won't get to all of them, but we'll do our best. Um, and with that, Chris, I want to turn it over to you to give us some information about the governor's proposed budget. Great. Thanks, Lucy. And thanks to everyone for the opportunity to be with you here as part of this program. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the context we're operating in because it's fundamentally um, changed the budget process this year. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the specific proposals. But one of the things we should start with, of course, is that in order for the budget to be able to spend money, it has to have the revenues to do so. And the revenue picture has been one of these really changing and dynamic issues that we've been dealing with uh, for those of us that watch the state budget. In January, the governor introduced a budget that has a spending plan of $158 billion in the state's general fund or its main checking account, so to speak. And um, in less than a month, the governor was announcing that there's another $10 billion in unexpected revenue collections that have come in. And that could, those kinds of increases could happen again before there's another budget proposal in May. Um, and that's being driven by a very disparate um, set of economic conditions where folks at the very top and large corporations are really thriving right now. And most other Californians are struggling to deal with the ramifications of COVID-19. But the state's revenue system is driven by those collections that happen at the top. And so the state's finding itself with a pretty rosy revenue picture, still some uncertainty about the years ahead. Um, and then also the potential influx of funds from the Biden-Harris relief plan that's being debated in Congress. So lots of things moving all at the same time that are affecting the range of what is possible as the governor and state legislators uh, figure out what this budget will look like. One way that I've been thinking about it is if you think about a $158 billion spending plan, and you think back in, uh, to January of last year, the governor had proposed a $154 billion spending plan. So in some ways it was almost like the pandemic didn't happen from a revenue and spending perspective, except for of course it did. Um, and we know there are these huge needs that the state needs to address. Um, and those needs are going to mean doing more than the normal. So it's great that the revenue picture is rosier than we had expected back in June or July, but the needs are also there and ever present right now. So public health responses, obviously, the economic responses around reopening schools, propping up childcare centers and providers, uh, providing rental assistance to strapped renters and landlords, cash assistance to people uh, who are, who've lost work and income, and of course, the nonprofits and small businesses that have been subjected to the closures and the loss of their income. And all of those needs are going to require significant investments, some of which are already being made, and I'm going to talk some about that here. So let's talk about what's in the governor's spending plan. And um, I want to stress two things. First, there's a lot of one-time good news, and you should really um, remember those words one time, because a lot of the revenue that's coming in uh, and some of the uncertainty about the future means the way that the governor is choosing to propose to allocate it is uh, in one-time ways uh, without making ongoing spending commitments. And that's a key source of contention. You'll see state legislators pushing back and advocates pushing back about. Um, there are also big gaps in the governor's plan. So while there has been some good news, and I'll walk you through some of that shortly, there are also big gaps, most notably the lack of ongoing funding in some key areas. Like for instance, there is an ongoing funding for local public health agencies who are all going to be depending upon to help deliver the vaccine and continue to monitor uh, and care for conditions at the local level. There's no ongoing funding to support homelessness services and the state had a homelessness crisis before the pandemic set in. 
Um, there's minimal funding beyond federal dollars that are being provided for the childcare system, where we know um, uh, anywhere from 30 to 50 percent of childcare providers and centers are closing as a result of the um, shutdowns of COVID-19. And getting people back to work and being able to care for children means that system's going to need some support. And then we're going to have to deal with eventually uh, we'll reach a point where the eviction moratorium will will be allowed to expire and people who have back rent and debt, we're going to need some assistance or we'll face other housing and homelessness sorts of challenges. So there's just a few examples of how the one-time funding is um, that I'm going to talk through shortly is helpful, but the ongoing needs are going to be with us. And that's what I think a lot of the debate is going to be about in the months ahead. I want to throw in one other little weird factor that's playing a big role in legislative um, responses to the governor's budget so far, which is there's also a rule on the books in California going back to 1979 that puts a spending limit in place, basically says that the state's spending can't grow um, too dramatically year in, year out. Uh, it's based on a series of factors and for how the um, population grows and how people's income increases. And the revenue picture, the revenues that have been coming in have, are now growing sufficiently faster that the spend, if we try to spend those at the state level, we go over the spending limit. And if we go over the spending limit, the money has to be given back to taxpayers and, uh, and half of it has to go back to taxpayers, half of it has to be given to K-12 schools. There's an emergency provision uh, that allows the governor and the legislature to say there, there's an emergency and they put the language in place for that emergency as part of this year's budget agreement that we're operating under. And that allows them to say that any spending that they're doing that's related to the emergency, in this case, the pandemic, doesn't count to the limit. Uh, and so that means, um, or let, let me sort of give you a reason why I'm going into this sort of weird technicality. It means that there's even more incentive for the governor and state leaders to look at one-time funding it may, because they need to count funding toward this emergency. And it means that there's, even though there's already a lot of one-time proposals, there's even more incentive for those one, kinds of one-time proposals. So you're gonna see even more emphasis there, I think. So that's kind of all things you need to know about what's driving the budget discussion. Let me talk up through quickly here a few um, uh, things that have happened and what's still on the table. So usually we wouldn't have budget actions that have been completed until June um, to start a July 1st fiscal year, but there have been emergency actions that have already taken place. The first of those was back in late January, state legislative leaders and Governor Newsom agreed to extend the state's eviction moratorium through the end of June and to use federal dollars to provide rental assistance. Uh, and so that moratorium is extended um, it provides eviction protections to tenants who pay at least 25% of their rent. It provides uh, some assistance to landlords uh, if they agree to take 80% of the back rent um, at the end of the process, essentially. Um, and it uses federal dollars to help provide that rental and landlord assistance. So um, that was already enacted because it was viewed as an emergency provision and the eviction moratorium that was in place already was expiring in a number of weeks. Just this week, as Lucy was saying in her introduction, the governor and state legislative leaders agreed to the Golden State Stimulus Package. This is a package that provides emergency cash assistance in a variety of ways. One of them is that it provides $600 checks to all households that are eligible for the California Earned Income Tax Credit, which is a tax credit for low-income working households. It provides an additional $600 for undocumented immigrants who also qualify for the EITC because those um, households were left out of the federal relief packages that were passed last year and would be left out of the Biden-Harris plan as well. Uh, and it provides an additional $600 to other state safety net programs like CalWORKs and SSI, SSP that provide cash assistance to low-income households, seniors, and people with disability. So the $600 checks or $1,200 in some cases uh, are going to start moving out the door over the next couple of months. As Lucy said, it also provides cash assistance for small business and cultural institutions. Uh, she's covered that it moves that number from $575 million up to over $2 billion. Uh, also really good news in terms of the assistance for those organizations. 
The governor and legislature are still trying to get the third piece of the emergency actions in place, which is about reopening schools. And if you're reading the newspaper and thinking about your kids, no, I'm sure you've all been following those debates and we'll see what happens with that. So that's what's happened already, or, and, and the, the schools piece is obviously still in play. There are a whole set of other proposals, obviously, that are part of the normal budget process, a process I'll be talking about in just a little bit. Uh, let me just run through a few highlights there. Um, in the health arena, um, beyond the, there's some emergency money, obviously, for public health, uh, for facilities and testing, and for uh, distribution of the vaccine and a public um, awareness campaign. Uh, in the uh, more traditional health arena, there's it's notable that there's no new ongoing funding for local public health departments, no expansion of the Medi-Cal system for undocumented adults, which had been something that the legislature has been trying to push the governor to do over the last couple of years. Uh, and there's some additional funding over a billion dollars for mental and behavioral health programs. In the homelessness arena, there's 1.5 billion in one-time funds for acquisition of properties, properties in the project home key um, system and for acquiring um, facilities to help with seniors and folks with behavioral health issues. So a series of uh, acquisition, one-time funding for acquisition supports there. There's some funding in the food assistance arena to expand uh, what's called the California Food Assistance Program. This is the program that sits on the side essentially of the federal food assistance program and the state's version of that called CalFresh. This is a program that's designed to serve immigrants who might not be eligible for CalFresh. Uh, it's been relatively small in funding over the years and there's over $11 million added into that program. Uh, and then uh, in the CalWORKs arena, um, our welfare to work program, there's $46 million in one-time funding to make sure that people who are in that program now will be able to receive up to 60 months in benefits. That's an expansion the state is moving to make by the next fiscal year. And they wanna make sure that those folks who are in it now aren't kicked off uh, in the middle of their implementation of this expansion. And there's a $50 million set of funds for a one-time one grant increase uh, that will start in October. Um, I want to note a, a key gap here. There, there is some funding in the state's uh, proposals going forward, $100 million in one-time funding for child care facilities, and there's pulling down of $400 million in funds from the federal government to support child care providers. Uh, but the state funding in the child care arena is pretty minimal given the state's revenue uh, windfall right now. And I think this is an area where you're going to see a lot of pushback from state legislative leaders and from advocates, because this had, this had been an area that had been prioritized in recent years for some new investment and, and helping build up the system. Uh, and there's relatively little in that arena that's in the governor's proposals. Although, like I said, I think you're going to see a lot from legislative leaders. So I'm going to stop there for now. There are pieces of this that I haven't covered, but we're, uh, I want to allow some time for other folks to comment. Um, and just note uh, before I stop that uh, one of the things to know is that while the, we talk about a lot about this in terms of this being about the governor's proposals, we're in that phase now where legislative leaders get their shot at this. And so a lot of this could change because legislative leaders are debating, hearing from advocates, hearing from the general public. And so what happens between now and May and now in June could be reshaped. Thank you, Chris. That's a great overview. We are getting a lot of questions about particular fields. And I know you've mentioned some, you've mentioned child care and housing and homelessness services, CalWORKs, a little bit about mental health. And we really can't get into every single field. We're inevitably going to leave some out. Can you you advise people on where to go to get information? I mean, we've been hearing about wanting to know more about veteran services, for example, senior services, arts program uh, in the allocations in the budget proposal. Where can people get more information about those specific? Yeah, I would, there you know, several places. And, and Luann, who uh, has a slew of resources she knows to drop on here, may want to add. But, um, you know, the first place is to read the governor's um, e-budget summary. That link was put into the chat earlier. Um, that you know, it's it's a big summary. It's several hundred pages long. But the sections you're looking for, like if you're looking for veterans affairs or you're looking for 
things for seniors. There are sections where you can go and you're not talking about having to read a lot. You're talking about how to read a few pages of overview. You have to remember it's the governor's document, so it's still a political document. So the framing has a political orientation to it. Uh, and if you want to counter that, in many instances, you can use the Legislative Analyst Office, which is essentially the budget office reporting to the state legislature. They have their own summary of the governor's budget proposal that's equally comprehensive and presents more of a, an objective view in their service to the legislature. Third place that I would just say is um, wherever, whatever your association or your trade group is, it represents your world, probably has a really thorough and um, detailed uh, summary of the stuff that most matters to you. Um, and there's a lot of organizations that provide that. I know Cal Nonprofits does that for their world. I know other folks here do that. So those would be the places I would look to. That's really helpful. Thank you, Chris. And I just wanted to remind everybody that you will get a link to a recording of this webinar, so you don't have to be taking notes. Um, and you will also get a copy of the slides. And in the e-alert that we send you, we will put some of these links um, in it uh, so that you can access those resources. And it would be great. It looks like Christina is putting the LAO overview right now um, in the chat box. Thank you, Christina. So Luann, did you want to add anything in answer to that question or, or Amber, Rose, or Brian? Yeah, um, I think that um, the um, both the Assembly Budget Committee and the Senate uh, Budget Committee have shorter summaries on their website that they have um, truncated. And so um, some of that may be more accessible and it's broken down by issue areas and that can be extremely helpful. And then on each of the department's website, they have um, summaries of, of greater summaries of, of what they were proposing and why we're proposing those the things that they are. So that's also extremely helpful. Um, so if you're looking for things in the aging world, you might want to look at the Department of Aging. And of course, um, sometimes issues span across um, departments. And so you sort of have to know where to look. So for example, in housing, you know, you might find some of the pieces in the Department of Aging, but you might also find it in HCD or um, the California Department of Social Services and whatnot. And then um, yeah, um, uh, entities like Chris's um, organization has really amazing information as well. Um, you know, it, every, everybody's got their own uh, bent, right, in terms of how they're framing the issue. And so depending on who you are and what you're looking for, you want to understand the administration's position and sort of how they're framing it. You want to understand the legislative position or the legislative analyst's position. It's not always the same thing and how they're framing it and understanding all of those things will help you with the um, counter arguments and, and, and knowing what people are dealing with so that you can be on point in your responses and your recommendations. Thank you. That is a great collection of resources. So we've got your own association. We have the LAO report. We have the reports that the legislature does. We have reports that the individual agencies do on these topics. Um, and then we have reports and summaries that organizations like Chris's um, do. And I may have left some out, but that's a, that's a great uh, set of resources right there. So one other question that we have related just to kind of the proposal, and I'm not sure if this is answerable, but we'll go ahead and ask it and we can always say we can't answer it, but people are wondering what the impact of the governor's proposed budget is on counties and cities. And I don't know if you can say that generically, if there's anything, but just because I know that people are really concerned about local budgets as well. So I don't know if anybody wants to take that one. Chris, I'll defer to you as the <laughs> yeah I, I don't know if there's one answer to that it's going to depend a lot on individual areas you know like so for instance um there's been an effort uh, a good effort to reduce the fines and fees um, that are being paid for the local court systems um, so that we're not burdening people who act who, who come into contact with the local justice systems, state justice system, we're not saddling them with them with debt, but that also reduces revenues of local counties. And so the state government as part of the governor's proposal would backfill some of that lost revenue in order to 
hopefully facilitate the continued um, reduction of those fines and fees. And our, my friends at Curb here will probably have more to say on that topic. Um, there are some other areas, you know, it just depends, right? There's a lot of areas where the counties deliver services in concert with the state, uh, particularly in the safety net. So there's a lot of interaction there. So if money goes up for Medi-Cal, a lot of that funding is going to flow through counties, but there wasn't a proposal there necessarily. Certainly in the homelessness and public health arenas, there's a lot of interaction. So there's not really one answer to it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the beginning of uh, COVID, um, when the um, talk about the economic hit was going to be extreme at all levels of government, um, there was a big push by the local communities to get more assistance from the state. And the challenge at that time, of course, was that the state itself was anticipating a significant economic loss and so didn't necessarily have the money for that. But the reality is that in the context of the flow of the dollars, whether it's federal dollars coming through to the state and then the state passing it on, like um, the needs, the vocalization and the needs of the local jurisdictions are considered. In, and they're considered in the context of how much money the um, local entities are themselves getting directly from the federal government, right? Um, you want to be able to be there to fill the gaps, but you don't want to necessarily duplicate funding when you don't have to because there's always the issue of scarcity and where the money should be spent. And then in the context of things like the EITC or CalWORKs grant increases or Frankly, when you're funding these state programs, they all flow to the counties and the cities because that's where the people are, right? Um, and so you you may, and even with you know the, the funding in SB 87, right? It's going to flow to the local communities. In essence, that's how it all works. Um, and so um, there's there's always a lot of thinking about you know who you want the money to go to and whether it's going to go directly to people or whether it's going to be channel in some way or it's going to come through by way of supportive services and 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 so there's you know it's like when we talk about food do you want to give people cash directly so that they can spend it in whatever way that they want or do you want to give them vouchers or boxes of food so that it's sort of more limited in what and the flexibility or what people can do with it and um and so in response to some of the requests that have come in, you know, the money has flown and particularly in the aspect of um, coronavirus response, right, to the local jurisdictions, uh, the state has utilized all of its money and passed it on to, to other jurisdictions. Yeah, could I speak on that for one second? Yes. Yeah, thank you so much, Sam. Um, and thanks and hello to everyone. And I, I was struck by that word scarcity because I think it, it could come up again as we speak. And, you know, the reality is, is California has been navigating a culture of austerity and abandonment for decades. And California counties are struggling to provide essential health and human services as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to rage on, especially, for instance, in LA County. And, you know, Thinking of ways the 2021-22 state budget should prioritize the health of local municipalities by funding alternatives to incarceration, for instance, and community-based services informed by public health framework. Uh, you know, there can be increases and earmarks uh, for CARES Act funding to support jail population reduction. We can amend AB 109 to prioritize care, which it's not doing now reclassifying AB 900 for Care First Capital projects that uh, uh, invest in communities, and also thinking about funding just transitions um, uh, for folks who are moving away from careers that harm, like for instance, uh, working in law enforcement or working in county jails to careers that heal. So really looking for all the different ways we can move money from the state to the county different counties, especially rural counties, um, that often need it most. And that's that's something that should underpin, I think, a lot of our thinking. Well, thank um, you. To all. Oh, go ahead, Luann. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lucy. Brian, I really appreciate what you're saying. 
And it is so true because in the context of scarcity, you know, sometimes we go, um, we want to do something and the pot is only that much because after the other expenditure, there's only like this much left, right? And one way to think about how we want to change our society and civilization is to think about what we're doing with the money that we currently have and whether it's wise in the way that we are spending it and whether it's getting results. And so what you're saying is completely on point in terms of how do we think about effectiveness and the purposes of our dollars and what we wanna achieve in our societies and the kind of societies that we wanna have and then how we take those monies and use it for, for the things that meet our intentions and goals and needs. And um, I know that, so my new boss is gonna be Senator Bradford. And um, I know that that is something that he is very interested in. And so I'm very excited that you guys are on this panel and that uh, we'll be having more conversations like this one on that topic. Congratulations, Luann. I'm glad to hear you've landed in such a great place. And thank you for all your comments, all of you. Um, well, let's move to the next topic. I think some of the things that Brian was saying um, make for a, a perfect segue to what is the budget process? And then after that, we'll talk about how we can be directly engaged in it. So um, Chris, I'm going to turn it back over to you. But please, Luann, I know you're going to be jumping in. And Amber Rose and Brian, I encourage you to as well. Brian. Chris. Great, great, thanks Lucy. So yeah, this is a quick overview of the state budget process. That's part of a broader training that we provide and you can find under the same title on our website, um, the in-depth information. And I'll throw some links into the chat here when I'm done, but this is just sort of a quick overview of the budget. So let's talk about the process and the fact that the budget is a cycle. Um, there are three key periods, January to mid-May, mid-May to June, and then uh, lesser known in many instances, but equally important uh, part of the cycle is July to December. So um, from January to mid-May, um, what happens is the governor proposes a budget. He's required to do so, or she's required to do so by January 10th. Uh, that allows the legislature and the public to weigh in on the proposals thereafter. Um, that's based on a, um, work that the Department of Finance does, working with the governor, and then the Department of Finance makes adjustments, works with the governor to prepare a May revision that has to be, uh, by statute, put out by May 14th. So there's this big period in between, obviously, between January 10th and May 14th, that is when the legislature does its work and conducts uh, hearings through, through the budget committees and the budget subcommittees, uh, takes public testimony, hears from advocates. Um, and so that's the period that we're in right now, the, the, that, that January to May period. Then there's a mid-May to the end of June period, which is much more intense. Um, the governor releases this revised budget, the second bite at the apple um, in mid-May. And then the legislature through its committee structures uh, tries to do as much deliberation as it can in a very short and intense period of time um, to respond to and, and try to adjust uh, what the governor has proposed. And then they usually come together by late May through budget conference committee that meets to iron out the differences between the Senate and the Assembly's individual proposals and how they're responding. And that conference committee uh, reaches agreement on what becomes the legislature's version of the budget that they then have to pass by June 15th uh, and send to the governor. Um, it has to actually be a little earlier than that because the budget has to be in print for three days like all legislative bills. So it's really June 12th. Um, so by essentially what happens by early June, the governor and state legislative leaders are cutting a deal uh, after that conference committee process um, in order to have a budget in place by the June 12th deadline and to have it uh, in front of the governor for the governor to sign to start a new fiscal year on July 1st. Uh, that's the part of the process we're kind of intensely in right now. There is another part of the process I'll just touch upon briefly, which is the period thereafter. This is a year-round cycle. So from July forward, there is 
work that goes on. And in fact, for you all as advocates, it's a really important time for advocacy because if you can work behind the scenes with your legislators, or their staff, with state agencies in the areas in which you work, and you can get your priorities incorporated into their budget proposals, those proposals can find their way into the governor's proposal. They can find their way into legislative proposals. Uh, and so the July to December period is also important. Just a few other things to know about the budget. One of the things to remember is that the budget itself, um, as Laura was saying earlier, is a, is a package. It's a, it's a bill like any other bill. It's uh, one bill that is the budget bill. I like to think of it as the main bill itself makes the appropriations or the allocations. But then there's a whole set of these budget related trailer bills, as they're called. And these often have the details that you need. They have the how is the money going to be specifically spent? How's it going to be implemented? Who's eligible? How will it go out the door? Uh, and so those trailer bills are really where we do a lot of the important work. So the package is this combination of the bill, the budget bill itself, and the trailer bill. Um, of course, you need to know who the key actors are, the governor, the, legislat the legislature, in particular, the key legislative leaders in uh, Senator Tony Atkins from San Diego, who's the Senate pro tem, and Anthony Rendon uh, from Los Angeles, who's the assembly speaker, and of course, the public in that process in terms of the hearings and the testimony and the outreach uh, to your legislators and your, your state leaders uh, make up the sort of triad of how this pro process is supposed to work. And we want to know a couple of other key folks. Uh, Luann knows this well because she's worked in this world. Uh, the budget committee chairs, uh, now Nancy Skinner in the Senate Budget and Fiscal Review Committee and Phil Ting for the Assembly Budget Committee play really significant roles here because they're overseeing the, the set of budget committees and rolling up the budget proposals from the state legislator, leg legislature and they'll largely govern that conference committee process at the end of things. And their main resource um, on the budget side, like with the Department of Finance for the governor, is the legislative analyst, uh, Gabe Pedick, and his team at the LAO. So these are all key actors uh, to know. And of course, you need to know your subcommittee folks. Like if you're in a particular area, the, the budget subcommittee that covers your area and the staff to that area are really vital to your own advocacy that you would do at the state legislature. Um, so uh, just a couple of other things to know. Obviously, I think most people are aware that the Democrats have two thirds majorities in both houses. Uh, that means that there are things that they can do that they, with those two thirds majority, um, if they so choose, like uh, they could choose to raise taxes, which requires a two thirds vote. They tend to be reticent to do that because it still involves political choices and ramifications, but they do have the ability to do certain things that a two thirds vote um, uh, the these super majorities allows. And then um, just a couple of final comments here about the process side. Um, just uh, remember that you, the public, have a role in it, right? We, we talked about the formal process here, but there are lots of ways to do that. Mail, email, social media, working with coalitions, um, works a little differently today. You can't do these lobby days and show up in the halls of the state legislature the way that you normally could. So it's happening a lot through virtual meetings uh, like this one. Uh, but the public has a key role here to play. It's harder to do that this year. I think that's one of the real challenges of last year and this year is it's been harder to do that advocacy without those usual mechanisms in place, particularly for the public. But it's still an important role. And then lastly, just to remember that budgets are important statements about values. So everything that we're doing here is about, as Luann said, those dollars and the services that go out to local communities to try to improve the lives of Californians. The budget itself is just a vehicle for that. It's not necessarily an outcome in and of itself. Uh, so as we do this work, we try to remember that it's a moral document and we're trying to make sure that it reflects the values of the people we represent at the end of the day. So that's a quick overview of the process. Like I said, there's a much more detailed version at our website and I'll drop a link in shortly in the chat. Great, thank you, Chris. Before we get into things that nonprofits can do to influence uh, the budget through these processes, does anybody else wanna add anything just around the kind of functionality of the process? Luann, Brian, or Amber Rose? We have a few questions from participants too, but would love to hear your thoughts first. 
Yeah, just we'll add that, you know, in the moving through the process for the for the public's input and impact on what's happening, folks have to be completely involved. I think right now what's important and what we've learned in, in conversations with, you know, consultants in the budget committees is that getting in your written comments is super key right now. Again, we're not able to do lobby days like we did before. Um, sometimes there's very technical issues when you're trying to make public comment while hearings are happening. Um, and so getting in your written public comment before hearings happen, and honestly, all throughout the process, even if there aren't hearings happening, is super important and engaging with the budget chairs. So, um, you know, if your issue area for like for us, it's public safety. So we're making sure that we're staying in contact with Senator DeRazo, who's the chair of the sub five uh, committee, uh, budget committee, and uh, with um, Assembly Member Christina Garcia on the assembly side. So making sure you know um, who those folks are and staying in contact with them. And also drumming up lots of support in the community. It's not enough to reach out once or twice. You've got to do it the entire way through um, and drumming up lots of support in your community. So reaching out to partners in your community um, and in your network and making sure that folks stay on top of that communication is super key and making sure that we're able to get you know, some of our priorities on the table. Thank you, Amber Rose. And when, when Amber Rose is saying sub five or sub four, that's referring to budget subcommittees. So I can, Chris said that around each issue area, there are these subcommittees that discuss different budget issues related to those topics. So um, that's what sub four or sub five means. And they're, they're five, it sounds like is public safety. So great. Luann, did you wanna jump in? Yeah. Um... You, you know, um, so many things, but I think the first thing is that the budget, it's not a closed world, right? It's like a cell um, that um, has, that, that allows penetration through osmosis. So there's ways to penetrate it. And I think that the other thing that we have to recognize that there is a bit of a divide between the people at the Capitol and the policy world and the people like you all, um, many of whom are doing direct service work. And so there's a way that so many of the nonprofits that are um, on this uh, Zoom webinar right now know what's going on and see um, the individuals that are impacted in the communities in ways that um, the legislative staff may not. And so it's really important to um, communicate what the needs of the communities are, sometimes because we're just simply not aware. But if we were aware, we would want to do something about it. Um, you know, I, I find that the people in the Capitol and the staff who do this work and the members want to be responsive because they're in it to do good and they really do want to help uh, their communities and they do want to alleviate suffering where they see it. And But part of it is that they don't always understand or see what the problems are. And so it's about being able to present the problem and also um, to present solutions to the problem or modifications to the administration's proposal that would better capture the needs of the um, of the community. And of course, the ways to do that are to actually just communicate what that is. And as Amber said, um, it, you know, when you're doing this, you should treat it like a campaign. You know, like, like people running for office, anything that you're wanting to get done, you should treat it like a campaign. And what that means is that you just can't have the one conversation or even the two conversation. You have to think about all of the modes of communication, all of the individuals in the path of power and the, and the pathway to get there. So even if someone's not on budget, you should still communicate to a member or a staff because that person can take it to somebody else, right? Um, take it to the assembly, take it to the Senate, take it to the administration. The more people hear what the problems are, the more you're gonna get everyone to be in alignment and you need alignment in order to get to the finish line. So you want to get as many people listening to you and your problems and your solutions as much as you can. Thank, Thank you so you. much for that, Luann. Go um, ahead. Would it, would it be okay if I jump in? Thanks. I yeah, just wanted, 
I feel so many things Luan said resonated with me. And um, I'm, I also think siloing is something that especially staffers have to start thinking about. For instance, um, incarceration is a public health crisis. And Amber Rose and I are two people, and we spend a lot of time uh, talking to the sub five on public safety. But in actuality, um, incarceration is an environmental crisis. So many of these prisons are built on toxic land. And I think that when communities who are working on intersectional issues reach out to other folks, a lot of times there's this, oh, well, how does it connect to me? So all of these opportunities we can create to draw these interconnectivities for people seems really important. And for the staffers themselves in whatever way possible, um, to, to start thinking that and thinking of how they're siloed and talking to each other and that a justice deputy needs to be talking to public health people and the environmental folks need to be talking to the uh, prison reform folks. And really that a, a lot of these issues, especially when we're talking about issues that impact um, the communities that are most in danger, like prison and jails, that we really have to start thinking holistically across all areas of government about how to address them. Great, thank um, you. Oh, go ahead, Louie. Um, a tool. Um, what I try to do uh, with the, um, I provided in my, I, I created a one page resource sheet uh, with various websites that folks can go to. And those websites have information about the budget and the budget process and um, individuals who are the lead players in the budget process so that people can reach out to them. But um, so it's gonna be made, made, made available. So I won't go into it in greater depth just because Chris did such a great job of doing that already. So there's no need to repeat that. But one of the um, amazing um, tools that we have that maybe is underutilized is that there are these briefings that you all in the community can hold for legislative staff and members and invite them. And that's where things that have cross-sectionality, right, can really be reached across the board because through that mechanism and process, you can actually brief multiple individuals across various divides, um, depending on who you invite to the table. And so I find that in the past, those things have always been really good in terms of helping staff and members understand more, providing content for people to walk away, allowing us time uh, to ask questions and answer. And so it, it's something that I think it's a really wonderful tool. And if you're looking to work a particular issue area, it's something to think about. If I can just add one last thing as well, and thanks for that, Luann, so, so important. Um, and as we're talking about, you know, engagement uh, with the legislature and with the administration around budget and around other legislative issues, I think we should also just name the reality of how inaccessible it actually is. We're talking about for folks to reach out and for folks to get involved, but the reality is these offices are open during business hours. Lots of folks who are the most impacted and the most harmed by state sanctioned violence are not available to engage at these times, right? And so when we're thinking about funding, especially for nonprofit organizations that sort of act as liaison for communities to get involved in this work, it's so key um, because so many folks aren't able to make time uh, to do this kind of advocacy, um, which again, I think is, it highlights the importance of, you know, written comment and helping folks understand how to make written comment, how to submit that, who to talk to, where, where the targets are, because um, it's, it's actually not as accessible as as we're saying it is, right? And so our job is at, at Curb and other organizations to help folks gain that accessibility. That's, that's really great. Oh, go ahead, Louie. Just before you go, I just wanna remind people, yes, you will be getting a link to the recording of this webinar and all of the resources on Luann's one pager and all of the resources that have been put in the chat will be included in the e-alert that all registrants uh, to this webinar will receive after the webinar, probably early next week. Okay, Luann, jump in. Sorry. Well, I, you know, I'm I'm so happy that this webinar is happening for the nonprofit entities, and of course, um, I'm fond of the nonprofit entities. I come from the nonprofit world. I used to be at the East Bay Community and Child Care Law Center, and I did budget advocacy in both of those spaces. And one of the things that you know, I 
I sometimes question the um, utilitarian nature of our public education system, uh, because I really do believe that more people should be engaged in the civic political process, because it's about power and distribution of resources, which is what the budget is about. It's about who gets money, how and when, and what communities get their needs addressed. And, um, and what Amber Rose just said struck me so much because even when we're talking about this thing, there is something much more fundamental that needs to be changed. And that's um, the issue about access and education. So, you know, working at the state capitol, I don't feel, I, I feel like I take all the, almost all of the meetings where I get asked. I read almost all of the comments that come through. Not everyone does, just to be honest. Um, and I listen to all of the hearings. So it's not necessarily that staff or people don't do that because I think that most of the people in the building value what they don't know, right? And value the information that bring, uh, value the people that bring information to them. It's the fact that we have found foundationally a structure that doesn't educate the public well, including the legislature, um, to understand the process and to use it in a way that makes the most sense. And so, for example, we have tons of people on EDD right now, you read Reddit or Twitter, all of the citizenry is mad over EDD and rightfully so. We have a public hearing, no public comment right? There's a huge divide. And so it's really important for the people who are on the webinar to bring the people that they work with to the table, because sometimes the voices of the impacted people are much more important and much more valuable. And sometimes they deserve to be at the table even more so than most. Great. Well, thank you to all of you. This is a really rich discussion. And I want to get to some questions. We have some that are nitty gritty, some that are more strategic. Um, let's start with some of the nitty gritty ones about the process. Can you all talk a little bit about how the process has been different this year? I mean, we've already talked a little bit about some budget bills that have been rushed through. I don't know who wants to take that, but I don't, Chris, you've been quiet for a while. I don't know if you want to take a first stab and then we'll hear from others. Yeah, you know, I, I certainly haven't been inside of it. So hearing, you know, how it's been different for Luann and the staff who this is such a busy time of year for and usually and I'm sure still is now but in different ways. Um, but it's just a lot. It's been a lot more challenging to access um, providing that public input um, in ways that we normally would, you know, there would normally be a lot of hearings right each subcommittee would have a set of hearings and the staff to, uh, would spend a lot of time putting those hearings together, making sure that advocates and stakeholders and the general public are heard from and interact with state legislators. And that often shapes a lot of what happens from there. And because of COVID-19 and um, you know, social distancing requirements, the ability of the legislature to hold as many hearings is, is, is just not there. So there's a lot, there's just a lot fewer access points. Uh, and then because of that, they're having to streamline other processes for like, how bills move, right? Um, and some of those, some of those are just a lot of things that are moving a lot more quickly. And when you add in some of these emergency actions where legislation has moved, budget legislation has moved much more quickly, I guess one observation I would have that um, you know is is concerning from like a public input standpoint. I think there's still been a lot of good decisions made. Um, is that essentially the governor and the key legislative leaders in both houses um, are really making a lot of fast decisions without as much public input as there would normally be. I think they're often making good decisions, so I, that's not meant to be a critique of the quality of the decisions, but uh, I don't think there's been as much chance for all of us to shape that work uh, as there would have been in prior years. Great, thank you. Anybody else wanna add anything? to that one. I'd add just a little bit again about accessibility, um, especially in the moment of COVID when schools are closed, children are at home, folks are struggling with housing and shelter, folks don't have uh, dollars to pay for internet access, which is important if you're trying to send in emails and public comment, folks have issues with access to telephones, right? So all these things impact uh, folks' ability to participate. Um, I got a couple of, you know, taps 
the other day when uh, the Assembly Public Safety Committee Budget Committee meeting was happening and folks were saying that there was some public comment, but there wasn't much. And I think that all of those things are impacting the way that people are, are able to reach out. Um, another thing that we're noticing is that, you know, there's this kind of constant fear of too much justice around criminal justice reform, right? Um, and so as we're moving through the moment of COVID and things are kind of rushed and kind of um, processes are being streamlined differently, we're hearing back from, honestly, from lots of legislators that are not willing to push forward the kind of issues that touch around shifting dollars away from corrections and into um, uh, services that actually sustain community infrastructure to keep people away from crisis um, because they think that they should be prioritized other things. It's not as important to folks. So part of our the big job that we have is kind of shifting the narrative around that and getting folks to understand that this is an issue that cannot wait. Um, the issue around shifting dollars away from corrections should be prioritized um, you know, over anything really, because there's lots of wasted funding there. So I think that's another thing that I've noticed in the moment of COVID um, that has even a, a, a you know, um, harsher impact than normal. Okay, that there's been this weird priority shift that is having a strange effect on certain really vital policy issues. Well, let's dig in a little bit deeper to what people can do. Um, we're getting a lot of questions about, uh, and some of them I think might be answered in your one pager, Luann, but if we can tackle a little bit of it here, that would be good. How do you find out where to make public comments? Amber Rose, you talked about that people can submit written comments to subcommittees and to, to committees, but where do you go to find out how to get the phone number to dial in, to stay on the line for four hours until, <laughs> until the public comments? Where do you go to get that information? Mm -hmm. On the one pager, there is the website for the Assembly Budget Committee and the Senate Budget Committee. And both, if you go on to either website, they'll have information for the log in um, and the telephone number um, to call to make public comment. Um, you know, for organizations, I think that it's really good to hold people's hands for uh, most, a majority of the public have never done this before. And then when you talk about people who may have language access gaps and whatnot, that's even harder and more complicated. And that's so many Californians, right? And so we, um, you know, um, what this, before COVID, we didn't have hearings on Zoom and right, and we didn't have people being able to call in. So in fact, this COVID has put has brought us into a brave new world for better and for worse. And there's arguments that maybe some of these hearing modalities could be better because for people who don't have money, right, uh, and can't travel, um, getting on the phone could be a viable option if they want to provide feedback into the op into that process. And if you are an, organiza an organization that has organizers, it's good to do a practice run with the people that you work with to say, how can something like that um, be done? And so um, I think that some, some sort of civic training is useful um, in this regard. Um, I would also say this, that there are so many ways that people receive information and one should not discount the importance of feelings and how things impact people's quality of life and their mental health and all of that. I mean, you know, that really does matter to people. And why do I say that? Because there's a way that public comment, depending on who you are or what you're saying can be really important. But there's also a way that when another human being is in front of you, whether it's through Zoom or through the telephone or in person, six feet apart or however, um, that there's a way that you can you can experience someone differently in different spaces and that's something to think about so when you think about your campaign don't just think about one modality of communication think about all of the modalities of communication that you have before you and how you can utilize all of them and i say that because i just think that like being able to do what we are doing now and have conversations is so important to how to move things if you're really serious about it. Thank you, that's really helpful. And there are a lot of nitty gritty details that uh, it's good to know if 
the budget subcommittee or committee chair says we want to limit the comments to one minute, then you really want to be sure that you limit your comments to one minute, but then you've also got the option of doing the the written comments and putting in a little bit more, but telling stories uh, using data, but also telling personal stories is really effective. Cal Nonprofits is gonna be doing a series of really short advocacy videos with little tidbits on how to engage in these different ways. So stay tuned for that. We're just working, starting to work on those, but uh, they will be available at some point in the next couple of months. So we've got a couple more. We're going till 1115 if, if everybody can stay on because I, this is just such a rich discussion and such great information. So we've got a few more questions I wanna make sure to get in. So people are asking about how to track budget trailer language in bills. I mean, how do you find out which bills are the ones to follow? And then how do you how do you track that those language changes? Um, on the Department of Finance website, uh, from the uh, position of the administration, they post their um, trailer bill language on their website. And there's a prompt specifically for trailer bill. Um, and then, you know, we don't talk, I mean, the advocacy world isn't so much into these things called BCPs. Does anyone know what BCPs are? The first time I was like, what the heck is a BCP? A BCP is a budget change proposal and it's essentially uh, a document from a department that talks about, you know, what resources it needs. And that sometimes have to do with staffing or programming and whatnot. And while it's not, talked about there's a way that governance really impacts you know uh, communities like if the EDD doesn't have enough staffing then you have people on the phone for days waiting um, or you know if GoBiz isn't functioning correctly then the services that's needed so there's a way that if you're engaging with government entities you should also think about budget change proposals and there's a lot of BCPs and sub five and the context of how prisons are being operated and what should be done about them and what we should fund. Um, so that's that's a, another um, area to look at in the context um, of the budget. So people can work directly with the administrative agencies on their budget change proposals, but can they also advocate then with legislative staff around those BCPs? Okay, all of the above. Everything and everything you want, you know, just make sure that it makes some logical sense, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Have it be rationally related and whatnot. But you can have an impact on everything, mainly because I think that the budget world is so big. It is such a vast, vast world. And it's really hard to know everything in it. And so we're always looking for people who know more than we do. And that's a lot of people, <laughs> right? Um, and so we take what information people have and we incorporate it into what we know about the structure or the capacity of the funding and whatnot and raise the issue. So it's really important because um, I think that staff and, and members really wanna do the best that they can and be responsive to the, to the public and even change some of these um, spending structure that currently exist. Um, I would say this, there is a, there, you know, trailer bill language is easier to find when it's coming from the administration. Now, the reality is trailer bill language also comes from the legislature and the um, community. And when it comes from the community, it's generally hidden and it's not um, generally seen until it's time to be voted on or three days before. Sometimes if you're lucky, a subcommittee could hear it and they publish it like Nicole Vasquez in sub three in the assembly. She's really good at publishing the trailer bill language so as to be transparent and whatnot. But that's not necessarily true of the entirety of the um, budget subcommittees. And so there is, a element of, uh, frankly, lack of access and lack of transparency there. And, um, you know, I think the best thing to do is to ask. Great. And it's, there are email addresses that people can use, right, that are on these assembly and Senate websites. 
And then as people build relationships with budget committee consultants, they can also interact with the consultants directly, but start a good starting place is those, those um, email addresses that are on the websites. Mm -hmm. So we talked about the trailer language sometimes being hidden. I've experienced uh, working on legislative bills where that language has then ended up in a budget bill. So that's also a way that nonprofits can take their expertise, expertise and use it to get trailer language into a budget bill. Um, anybody want to comment on that strategy? I, I'd be happy to do that. Um, so when I, in 2005, I came to the East Bay Community Law, Law Center right out of law school. And uh, in my job interview, I was asked about um, the maximum family grant rule, which basically says the children who are born into welfare cannot get aid. And by that time, I, my family had been on welfare growing up. Um, I grew up in Fresno. And so when I was growing up on welfare, that policy didn't exist. Uh, and my, you know, and we left welfare when I graduated from high school in 1994. Two years later, the MFG rule was implemented um, and passed. And so I didn't know about it until I came to this job interview. But I basically then spent 10 years trying to eliminate this policy that I thought was a vestige of slavery, working with so many people in the community to do it. And it took 10 years to do it. And we first started out as one bill and then another bill and then another bill. And then at some point we kind of got wiser and we, thanks to the help of budget staff who told us, you know, this is not really a bill play. This is a budget play. Aha. Uh -huh. Why? It's a lot of money. It was going to be $240 million to do that. And the challenge is by the time that the budget is passed, all the money has been spent. And so if you have a policy bill that doesn't involve a, month, a lot of money, you can go through the policy process and it'll be fine. But if you have a bill that involves any significant amount of money, you might get a governor's veto message that says, sorry, no money left, try to do it in the budget next year. Okay, so when you think about what you're doing, also think about whether it involves expenditures. And if you do, think about whether you need to take it through the budget process so it can be funded, so that if it requires money to implement, that the money comes along with it. Um, and if you wait, then it might be too late for that. So um, dual budget bill plays can be very important because you also have to recognize that in budget, we're not always comfortable passing policy, right? But if you can get something in policy and it's passed through multiple committees, then the budget committee will have a better assurance of its support before putting it in the budget process. So that's something I think that people should be aware of. Great, thank you. Well, this is a wealth of information. We've got about five minutes left and I wanted to give each of you a chance just to say a 30 second to one minute, you know, any final tips or advice you have for participants about how to be engaged in the budget process. So um, who wants to go first? Oh, and by the way, Luann, can you just say what Subcom 3 is, what that topic is? We have a question. You referred to sub to sub three and people want to know which do you remember offhand oh, is anybody <laughs> sub three is is well sub three sub one in the assembly is health and human services and sub okay. three in the senate it's health and human services perfect thanks okay good try to unpack the sorry the target no no it's fine it's fine i knew you'd know it by heart um okay who wants to go with just a, some quick closing comments I would love to be able to speak a little bit about how philanthropy can support this work. Could that would that? be wonderful, Brian. Thank you. That was on my list of questions. Thank you. And I'm going to take more than 30 seconds. I'm going to take 45 because um, I'm one of the few Black folks here, and I'm going to take up a little bit of space. And the things um, that I think we have to talk about are really important. 
um, philanthropy can create containers for budget skill building about budgets. You know, I know uh, uh, a lot of folks from philanthropy are concerned about funding lobbying, and that's not necessarily what you have to do in order to support this work. Borealis Philanthropy, for instance, created an incredible Invest Divest community learning series for grantees to expand their knowledge of justice reinvestment. They also sourced expertise for their grantees. We at Curb were able to work with a budget consultant as part of the uh, support that we received from them last year. Um, philanthropy also, what we really need is for folks to become co-conspirators in the resistance as we fight really what's an economic war um, against black people and black lives. And I'm gonna a guess that there's a lot of white people and white led organizations in this space as well. And, and my loves, it's not enough to be an ally anymore. Um, we need you to be a co-conspirator. We need you to have our back, to carry water, to pull levers from behind the scenes, be a soldier, be a spy. It's time for folks to decide what team people are on. Philanthropy can carry our message, which is for Curb, that a budget is a statement about our values. Um, and I think also philanthropists, philanthropy can, can serve very much, they're seen, of, they're seen as gatekeepers. And really, I think what we need are key makers. We need philanthropy to become key makers and help community actualize their goals. For instance, in LA County, you know, we're going through this huge Measure J process, uh, which sets aside 10% of net county costs for community-based organizations and alternatives to incarceration. And real talk, folks, it's a, it's a struggle. And thanks to folks like the California Endowment, they've made things much, much easier. And in fact, instead of having that money be at the county where it should be, is that a third-party philanthropic administrator that allows um, uh, uh, community to access those funds without having to jump through uh, uh, county contracts, um, uh, which are so difficult to navigate. Uh, and in reality, you know, it, beyond being that third party administrator, what has to happen is that these public private partnerships have to cultivate the decision making power with CBOs, so that that if they do have this ability, um, this uh, key making ability, and the ability to help decide where some of this money uh, goes, that the process is in fact led by a black a black led advisory body that's uh, partnered with that philanthropic institution, so that you know there's new opportunities for empowering disenfranchised and impacted communities uh, through these public private partnerships. Did I come in under 45? Was that good? Uh, it doesn't matter. That was a wealth of information. <laughs> I'm so glad. I'm so glad you touched on this topic, Brian. Okay. So uh, very quick closing comments. I mean, if you could really keep it, keep it short. Amber, would you like to go? Amber Rose, I'm sorry. Would you like to go next? Sure, sure. Yeah, just to remember, um, you know, to try and help make you know the the engagement process more accessible to folks um folks you know funders we definitely need support continually so that we can make that um, available to folks language translations getting folks just um, time to be available um, we have to pay folks for their time we're talking about um you know folks who are most impacted we have to be able to reach into our funds that you all are supporting us with and give them to community so that they can make time to show up another thing i think that funders should know is just to Fund people generally so that you can fund their ideas. A lot of times we look at victories as a policy win or a budget win, either either in opposition to some kind of budget allocation or in getting some kind of budget allocation. But the truth is sometimes a win looks like bringing other people onto our vision and into the work, educating folks and getting people the skills to do the work. So we have to open up our minds about what victories look like and open up our pockets to fund generally and to fund the community's ideas. What we're doing is unprecedented and monumental um, and what we have done over the past seven to 10 years. So I think that just you know, continue to remember it's about funding the ideas and the education um, and the movement of the bodies in the community. Thank you for that. Okay, Chris Luann, very quick closing comments. Um, I would say this, that um, I, I believe that each one of us can be agents of change you know, and that uh, when people come to the table with purpose and mission, um, their, the grounding in their truth and their belief 
does matter and it does have an impact on people. And if we see ourselves as agent of change, we can go about, um, as Brian and Amber um, said, to change, to change the world and to change it through all of the mechanisms that are at play, including the budget process. And like the things like the Golden State Stimulus and the EITC, all of that stuff came from the community. Those were not necessarily the idea of an elected official or politician. They came through the community, right? And so the community matters. Great, thank you. And Chris, quickly. I don't, my colleagues uh, said it extremely well. There isn't anything I can add other than to say what they said uh, and appreciate uh, what they've offered here at the end. Wonderful, well, thank you to our all of our awesome speakers, Chris, Luann, Amber Rose, and Brian, thank you so much. And I also want to thank, yeah, really fantastic conversation. We need more time. Um, but I also want to thank our great tech team, Christina Dragonetti and Christine Metropolis, and also the partners on uh, the Policy Forum, that's Philanthropy California and the League of California Community Foundations, and also our closed captioner today. So bye-bye all.